भगवंत टी सरने न सह पंच शीलानी दुतियांपी अहंगबंत टी सरने न सह पंच शीलानी ततियांपी अहंगबंत टी सरने न सह पंच शीलानी नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समो तस् भगवत अर्हत समो तस् भगवत अर्हत समुधस नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समुधस नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समुधस नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समुधस ततियंपी ते शरण गमनानि तीतां आमा बन्ते पाणाति पाता वीरमणि सिखा पदं समादियानि पाणाति पाता वीरमणि सिखा पदं समादियामि अदिन्ना दाना सिखा पदं समादि अदीनादानावेरमणिशिखापदंगसमादियामिकामेसुमिचाचारावेरमणिशिखापदंगसमादियामिमुसावादावेरमणिशिखापदंगसमादियामि मुसावादावेरमणिशिखापदंगसमादियामिरामेरयामदपमादयामिरामेरयामदपमादयामि इमानि पंच सिखा पदानि सीलेन सुगतिं अंति सीलेन भोग संपदा सीलेन निपुटिं अंति तस्मा सीलं सोधाये साधु 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 अ चैप्टर फोर द डिवीजन ऑफ एक्सपोजिशंस Vibhanga Vaga. So we're on page 1039, um, Sutta 131, Badekarata Sutta, A Single Excellent Night. And thus have I heard, um, note 1209, which says, This discourse with a lengthy introduction and notes is available separately in a translation by Bhikkhu Nananda under the title, Ideal Solitude. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, an Appendicus bar. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, 
because I shall teach you the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night. In the first edition, I followed in, in rendering by the Karata as one fortunate attachment. At the suggestion of Venerable Tanisaru Bhikkhu, however, I have changed it to a single excellent night, which seems more likely to be correct. Rata and Rati could be taken to represent, respectively, either SKT, Ratra, and Ratri, which equals night, and SKT, Ratka and Ratki, which equals attachment. NM had taken the words in later sense, but the fact that neither MA nor MT glosses Rata implies that night is intended. For if the word were used to mean attachment, an unwholesome state of typical Buddhist discourse, some commentarial clarification would surely have been offered. The Central Asian SKT version, the SKT title, and at the head of the Tibetan version and the Tibetan translation itself, all use Badrakarati. This confirms the identification of Rata with night. The change from E to A can be understood as an attempt to convert a difficult reading into a more familiar one. I'm indebted to Peter Skilling for this information. The Chinese Madhyama Agama has merely transliterated the title of the SKT version and thus offers no help. Apart from the series of suttas, the expression Badekarata does not occur elsewhere in the Pali Canon. M.A. merely says a single excellent nighter is one with a single night who is excellent because of possessing application to insight. Badekaratasa ti vipassana yogasa matakatata Badekasa ekaratasa. MT simply gives word resolutions. Ekarati, ekarato, bado ekarato, etasati, badekaratam. And says this refers to a person cultivating insight. As the verse emphasizes the urgent need to conquer death by developing insight, the title probably describes a meditator who has had a single excellent night and day devoted to practicing insight meditation invincibly, unshakably. NM says in MS, it might be supposed that the expression Badekarata was a popular phrase taken over by the Buddha and given a special sense by him. It was not infrequently done, but there seems to be no reason to do so and there is no evidence for it in this case. It is more likely to be a term coined by the Buddha himself to describe a certain aspect of development. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the bhikkhus replied. The Blessed One said this. Let no person revive the past or on the future build his hope. More literally, the first two lines will be translated, let not a person rub run back to the past or live in expectation to the future. The meaning will be elucidated in this expository passage of the Sutta. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently ar arisen state. M.A. He should contemplate each presently arisen state just where it has arisen, by way of the seven contemplation of insight, insight into impermanence, suffering, no-self, disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, relinquishment. Let him know that and be sure of it, invincibly and unshakably. Asamiram, Asankupam, M.A. explain that this is said for the purpose of showing insight and counter insight. For insight is invincible, unshakable, because it is not vanquished or shaken by lust or other defilement. Elsewhere, the expression, the invincible, the unshakable, is used as a description of Nibbana or of deliberate mind. But here it seems to refer to a stage in the devel development of insight, 
the recurrence of the verb from Samirati in paragraph 8 and 9 suggests that the intended meaning is contemplation of the present moment without being mislead into the adoption of view of self. Today, the effort must be made. Tomorrow, death may come. Who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away, but one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly, by day, by night, it is he, the peaceful sage of Said, the peaceful sage, Santo Muni in the Buddha, who has had a single excellent night. How Bhikkhu does one revive the past? One nurtured the light, their thinking. I had such material form in the past. M.A. One find the light by bringing the beer upon the past, either craving or a view associated by, with craving. It should be noted that it is not the mere recollection of the past through memory that causes bondage, but the relieving of the past experiences with thought or craving. In this respect, the Buddha teaching differs significantly from that of Krishnamurti, who seemed to regard memory itself as the villain behind the scene. One nurtured the light, their thinking. I had such feeling in the past. I had such perception in the past. I had such formation in the past. I had such consciousness in the past. That is one who revived the past. This is a common translation of, of Vipassana's uh, insight, right? but that's not what it says. I mean, that that's it's pretty clear how how that's not a great translation because um, you're just translating the prefix "vi" as with insight. So to see with insight, it's hard to understand what could be meant by that phrase. It it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it's not really supported by the the word, I mean, the word is vipassati. I mean, so a simple way of translating it would be sees clearly. But he points out something interesting from the commentary, how it mentions both vipassana and pati vipassana. Though I'm not entirely clear what the word pati vipassana means. Pati is a prefix that means something like in response to, often against. But when you talk about like uh, vata pati vata, means um, duties and duties uh, in response. So monks have certain duties that they have to perform and also duties that they have to perform in response to the duties performed by others. So it seems that there's some idea here of the seeing clearly in response to something. Now, it might also mean... Um, no, it's, I think it's seeing clearly as a means of prevention. I think the idea here. So some things you, you see clearly, some things arise because you see clearly qualities arise, um, peace and happiness and so on. But other things cease because you see clearly. I'm, I'm out on a limb here, but my knowledge is just not deep enough to understand what is meant by vipassana, pati vipassana. Pati vipassana is not a word I've really ever come across very much. But um, but the word is flexible. I mean, there are ways, vipassana is used in different ways. There's anu vipassana and that sort of thing, different ways of using the word. But it's a pretty simple word. So w why this is important and why bring this up is because it's a, it's a great example of the usage of the word vipassana outside of the context of um, as a mental quality that you should develop where it's often coupled with samatha, so you have samatha and vipassana. But vipassana is, is, um, is found by itself quite often in forms like this, with tata tata vipassati. And so I mean, it's not, a, it's not, the translation doesn't prevent an understanding of that. It's just worth pointing out that quite simple, it's it's quite easy to understand what he's saying here. Don't go back to the past, don't go back to the future. In the present, see it clearly. And one thing he points out 
later on in the sutta is that even in the present, even though you might dwell in the present, it's easy to get obsessed with it as well in the similar way that you get caught up in the past or caught up in the future. If you don't see the present clearly, obviously, uh, you, you, get, you can get into trouble there as well. So the, the only thing I would say about the word insight is that it, it just it adds too much here. I mean, it's pretty simple. See clearly. And it, it's kind of, I guess that's deceptively simple. And seeing clearly can be trivialized. If you think, oh yeah, well, I, I think I see pretty clearly. When it's really the, th the, the thrust of, of the importance of mindfulness. That's what mindfulness does. That's why we use the mantra, because it creates focus and clarity, allowing you to see clearly. Seeing with insight, uh, though it shouldn't, it, 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 although it doesn't have to, it usually lends itself to some idea of reflection and contemplation and intellectualization. But uh, as the commentary says, um, relates to the three characteristics, which are, again, not something you contemplate or intellectualize. They're just something you see. It's, I mean, it's it, they're not hidden. They're only hidden by our lack of clarity. If you pay attention, it's that they're it's pretty obvious. Oh, this isn't imperm this isn't permanent. This isn't satisfying. This is self. This is uh, from from the part. This is something that is chanted, right? Like I I heard this many times. Kitang. Uh, it's something that is quoted. I quoted a lot. Ajahn Tong would quote quoted a lot. It's a common thing to quote. I also heard it in the. Uh... Chanting. Yeah, I quote it a lot, okay. but uh, we don't ch chant it that. It's not that common to chant that I've seen. It might be in our chanting book. Uh, somehow it's so familiar to me. This uh, maybe. Well, that, that's true. Um, where did I? Where did we chant this? I think it might have been chanted. Yeah, it might be in the Thai chanting books as well. Not as a regular chant, but as an occasional chant. It seems like we might have chanted it at Wat Thai LA or something in, in Los Angeles. And how because does one not revive the past? One does not nur nurture the light their thinking. I had such material form in the past. Note 12, 16. The syntax of the Pali allows this sentence to, to be interpreted in two ways by stating either that one thinks I had such form in the past, yet does not find delight in that thought, or that one does not find delight in the past by thinking such a thought. Ornor Jnanananda in Ideal Solitude and Jnanamoli in MS construe the sentence in the former way. I had pres preserved Jnana Moli's rendering in the first edition. On re reconsideration, I now believe that the second interpretation is more true to the intended intention of the text. This also ties in better with the stanzas themselves, which enjoin the dis disciple not to dwell in the past and the future, but to contemplate each presently arisen state just as it presents itself. End of the note. One does not nurture delight their thinking. I had such feeling in the past. I had such perception in the past. I had such form formations in the past. I had such consciousness in the past. That is how one does not revive the past. And how because does one build up hope upon the future? One nurtures delight their thinking May I have such material form in the future? Note 1217. In the first edition, this sentence was rendered, thinking, I may have such material form in the future. One finds delight in that. In retrospect, it now seems to, be, to me more likely that the sentence expresses an exclamatory wish for the future. End of the note. One nurtures delight their thinking. May I have such feeling in the future? May I have such perception in the future? May I have such formations in the future? 
May I have such consciousness in the future. That is how one builds up, up, up hope upon the future. 7. And how because does one not build up hope upon the future? One does not nurture delight their thinking. May I have such material form in the future? One does not nurture delight their thinking. May I have such feeling in the future? Etc. May I have such perception in the future? May I have such formations in the future? May I have such consciousness in the future? That is how one does not build up hope upon the future. 8. And how because is one vanquished in regard to presently arisen state? Note 12. 18. The verb here and in the next paragraph, Samirati, refers back to the line in the verse, invincibly, unshakably, Emma glasses. One is dragged along by craving and, ha and views because of lack of insight. Here, because an unthought ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, who has no regard for the future, for the true man, and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, regards material form as self, or self as possessed of material form, or material form as in self, or self as in material form. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how one is vanquished in regard to presently arisen states. I don't think invincible is correct. Just a second. What, vanquished in regards to present or is it? Carried away. It's a pretty simple word. I don't know why he uses vanquished. That's kind of poetic, but if you want to understand this simply, it's just carried away. That's sanghira. Sanghiranga sankupang. Ah, I just want to find the word for invincible. What is van vanquished? Well, vanquished means like conquered, like beaten by the present. Yeah. But, but it's, I... again, uh, unnecessarily complicated. It's quite simple. You get carried away, sanghirati. Uh, the the verb is usually used to refer to gathering together or or collecting, but but it is used quite commonly, as in this instance, in the past tense, to be carried away or that sort of thing. Har har is the root, sanghar, but it certainly doesn't need. I don't know how he gets vanquished and. And um, invincible is also, I mean, it's not what it says. It says if you were to translate the first as vanquished, it would be not vanquished. But he's trying to go back to the the, the asang hirang asang kupang. And uh, it's easy to, un it's helpful to understand them as a pair because kupa is a, it means shaken or kupa is related to the idea of being shaken maybe kampa as well i'm not sure what, what the actual base is but uh, is not moved by them but moved in the in a in a meaningful way like uh, affected by them so i mean it, it, it's not a terrible translation it's just a bit too much um easier to understand it as not disturbed by present states not upset by them but it's not just upset because it's also on the positive side it's not dragged away by them dragged away by desire dragged away by aversion it's not about that being invincible it's being about being unmoved unperturbed undisturbed is really the idea because why is it wrong to follow after them because it's a disturbance 
There's no need, there's no point, there's no value, there's no benefit if you chase after anything. There's really the, the deep and profound truth of the Buddha's teaching that nothing is worth clinging to. Clinging just doesn't ever bring, doesn't ever bear positive fruit. The single question uses the word adhina, which means pulled, pulled by it. Mm. Oh. Yeah, that's literally what it is. Ideas of vanquished and really also invincible. Is, like, how do you be, how are you invincible in regards to states, right? Uh, I suppose if you think that they can hurt you, but it's I think better to understand that states don't ever hurt you. It's important to understand that uh, they don't have the power to hurt you anyway, but they have the power to disturb you. Well, they don't have that power in themselves, but this is what happens: is we give them power by being disturbed by them by being pulled away by them. That's literally what it says. And if you don't do that, I mean, it doesn't say as far as I can see anything, but there's no word like invincible. It's just not pulled away by them. How is a big, uh, how is one pulled, disturbed? I mean, you might just um, get caught up in, gets caught up in them. Good way to understand it. And then the opposite is just not sanghirati. So it's not invincible. It's just is not caught up in them. That's all. And just a useful point to your understanding. Here, bhikkhus, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, does not regard material form as self or self as possessed of men or material form as in self or self as it. He does not regard it as self, perception as self, formations as self, as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how one is invincible in regard presently arisen states. Let not a person revive the past who has had a single excellent night. So it is. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Bhikkhus, I shall teach you the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night. That is what the Blessed One said. The Bhikkhus were satisfied or delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sad. 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 So yeah, you can see the, the point isn't about invincibility. You can see that from the idea of non-self. It's about, well, if, if you don't take it itself, you don't get don't take something as self, you don't get caught up in it. That's the point. Like this all is... of our troubles, if we if if you lose your job or if you become sick, how many different things we take we, we get caught up in worries and cares or relationships or goals and ambitions. If we take them to be ours, we start worrying about them, we start obsessing over them, we'll get caught up even in the present moment. And when you don't take them as self, you don't do that. You don't get caught up in them. You aren't disturbed by them. Bante, just a question regarding this topic. Um, it seems that with this uh, technique of meditation, um, it's quite uh, possible to understand properly the reality. But sometimes uh, I feel that um, it's like a proof, like there is something always... Uh, uh, bigger that is overwhelming you and brings you back to you know um, be caught up in this self so in this uh, you know view of you to be somebody or someone I don't know if I don't know maybe this, this for sure is the wrong view but yeah it seems that we have a proof or we are an obstacle and, some, and when you can uh, overcome something, then there is something always bigger that presents itself. And, you know, like uh, is uh, uh, blocking you from going forward. Nothing can block you from going forward. It's, um, there's, not a, there's not something else that you have to get to. You have to see clearly this thing that you think that you think of as blocking you so it's just a matter of practice mm. it's just lack of clarity i mean it's very powerful yeah. to just 
translate vipassana as seeing clearly instead of invoking this idea of insight or some kind of idea of knowledge or so like like intellectual or discursive thought or something if you're if you're taking things as non as self then you're just not seeing them clearly and well, it's pretty easy to re- uh, pretty simple to remedy not easy but the remedy is pretty simple it's just we'll just see clearly yeah this is this is is uh, clear what i wanted to say is just that the, the craving seems to be uh maybe deeper i know that is not even i think something like that but you know i, I don't know how to explain this one but you know because sometimes you know like i meditate and i can see things as they are i know that but then uh, on the other hand something else comes up and uh, uh, this sensation or perception of emotion they are really overwhelming and it brings me back to see myself as an entity yeah well i mean there is no self that sees clearly you can't this is can be can can be discouraging when you wonder why it is that you saw clearly before and now you're not seeing clearly now it's because it's, there's no self that sees clearly there's moments of clarity and those moments of clarity have power but they yeah. are in conflict with moments of lack of clarity and so it's a numbers game really you have a lot of uh, powerful habits of not seeing clearly they're just going to arise and overwhelm the habits of seeing clearly until you until you develop enough habits and strong habits of seeing clearly at the moment i know that uh, when i see clearly it is much more peaceful um i, j- I just want to say that uh, i think uh, this sutta is uh, pretty awesome about this like uh, it, the buddha says that you know whenever your mind is in the past or it goes to the future that's where you actually associate and feel like oh there is a self or make the perception of a of a self but if you are present here and now that's impossible i yeah. think it's well impossible. no i mean it's not impossible really actually not because he he makes quite clear that it's possible to take the present as self as well. Oh, present. So uh, a few points. The first point, let's go back to how awesome this sutta is. We didn't mention that, or we, it was mentioned, but we didn't point out how important it is. What you can say, I think, about the Buddhist teaching is the things that are repeated most often are going to be important. And there is nothing that is repeated like this one is. Um, This, to to see the same sutta five times in a row, is it five times? Four uh, four times, right? Yeah, four times. Four times in a row. It's pretty special. And another important point about that is, another thing that's very obvious, is that it's very short. Um, and so there's got to be something about what's spoken here that's very important. But an important takeaway, I think, is that what is important is not lengthy. What is important is not complicated. And it probably is one of the things I heard the most when I was in Thailand, this this verse, just because Ajahn Tong repeated it constantly. It was often his go-to when people had troubles to remind them, you know, hey, stop getting caught up in the past and the future. Uh, it's a pretty simple, just that first part, really. I mean, the whole thing is quite powerful, but the first part is really the thrust of it. How do you have a good day, a good night? Um, the, the, the word night is unsurprising because it's how they talked about the passage of time in 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 Pali and in, in Sanskrit. They talked about nights. They counted your age by nights. And when you let the 
well, we let the days and nights go by, but talking about uh, someone who is senior, you would say how many nights they had. It means how old they were or how senior they were. So how you have a good day or a good night, they would say, is to uh, really be present. But the um, what we can say about, so the points about what Ed was saying is what we can say about the present is it's the only place, it's only possible. What's special about the present moment is it's it's only in the present moment that it's possible to see clearly. Dwelling in the past, the past, an experience of the past doesn't have the capacity because it's not real. It's it's conceptual. You're conceiving or you're creating in the mind. But the present moment is special because it's where reality lives. Experience only occurs in the present. If you're thinking about the past, the thought is happening in the present. So a relationship with reality can only be framed around the present. If you're thinking of this, or if you're perceiving this thought as the past, when you're thinking about the past, you're not really seeing it as it is. You have no potential to see impermanent suffering and non-self. It's only when you see it as a thought in the present moment. In other words, it's only when you uh, think in terms of the present moment. And we, as we say colloquially, like dwell in the present or live in the present, live in the now. It's only when you do that that you can see clearly. But that being said, you can conceive about things in the present as being self. It doesn't have to be a thought about the past. Past and future are not the only things that uh, involve conceptualization. Lots of things do. People, places, things can all be present, but uh, are not real. And so are not also not conducive to seeing the three characteristics. Like samatha meditation can be very present, but it's not really seen clearly. It's right? seen clearly the, the conceptual reality of whatever the object, but it doesn't let you see the three characteristics. But isn't our our understanding of the three characteristics based on past experience? Because, for example, one of the reasons why I believe in impermanence is that everything I experienced in the past was impermanent. Yeah, but that's not vipassana. That's just your belief. Oh. That's what might be called dhammang samadaya. You accept the teachings, but that doesn't make you wise. I mean, it's wise in the worldly sense, but not, uh, it's not vipassana. Mundane right view. Right? Uh, well, there's, yeah, there's right view involved. Um, yeah, basically. It's uh, what we would call sutta mayapanya or jinta maya, no, sorry, jinta mayapanya, wisdom from thinking. Uh, but going back to this particular verse and uh, you saying that uh, even the present moment or present object can uh, be taken as self. So um, in this, I mean, I try to reread it um, and I don't, and I don't see that in this uh, particular verse. Not in the verse, but in okay. the explanation. How is yeah. one carried away by present states? Yeah, yeah, that's true. But I, I was just talking about, um, I mean, not just, but uh, my thoughts were with this verse only. Just because uh, when uh, somebody is not mindful uh, in the present moment, uh, there is uh, always uh, some uh, possibility that uh, you go carry away in the past or in the future. Is that uh... or in the present? You can get carried away in the present as well. So no, not just yeah. not just get carried away to the past to the future. You can get very lost in things that are completely about the present moment. Mm. But if you're Fair mindful, is, that's not possible, right? Like if you're mindful, that's not possible. If you yes, well, if you see clearly, it's not possible. Mindfulness allows you to see clearly. 
That's what he says. Yeah. Pachupanancha yoda mang tata tata vipasati. That's what's the crux of it. Being Sorry? in the present uh, uh, doesn't mean you are mindful. For example, if you see something you like, you are seeing something yeah. you like in the present moment. You just fall in love, love in, <laughs> in the present moment. And men, and a, a more uh, sort of spiritual example, people will enjoy a sunset or be very, they would say, I'm, I was very present with my music or that sort of thing, very present in sports or martial arts, Tai Chi, that sort of thing. Just being present isn't enough. I mean, it's not an accurate description of what's enough. Seeing clearly is much better. That's why the Buddha used this word. Or if you want to go deeper, seeing clearly, what does it really mean? Seeing with wisdom. I hesitate to use that word because it's not because it's a bad word, because of how we understand it. We think, oh, so I have to think about it, or I have to have some idea, some some uh, knowledge arise about it. Seeing clearly is the best way of explaining it. Wisdom in Buddhism is about uh, a clarity and familiarity. It's kind of like being more familiar because what you're trying to learn, the three characteristics, are not hidden. As I said, they're there. They're glaringly obvious. The problem isn't uh, that they're not showing themselves. The problem is that we're blind. We're, yeah in the dark, confused, and we have preconceived ideas about things. The pre Our preconceptions about reality are a huge part of the problem. It's not just that we're, it's dark, it's that we're, we're, we're hallucinating. We're seeing things that aren't there. And we're, we have preconceived notions that uh, cause us to jump to conclusions about things. Oh, this is good. Why is it good? It's good because people told me. It's good because I remember the pleasure of it. It's good because of this or that. Sometimes things are good just because I like these things. That's my preference or my personality. We cling to ideas of what I like and what I dislike. And so we perpetuate mistaken ideas of uh, goodness. So on. Simply by clinging to sense of what I like. Yes, thank you, Bante. That was a very important teaching that you just gave us. Majimunikaya 132, Ananda Barekarata Sutta. Ananda and a single e excellent night. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove and at Apindika's Park. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Ananda was instructing, urging, rousing, and gladdening the bhikkhus with talk on the Dharma in the assembly hall. He was reciting the summary and exposition of one who has had an excellent night. Then, in the evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to the assembly hall. He sat down on a seat, ma seat made ready and asked the bhikkhus, Bhikkhus, who has been instructing, urging, rousing, and gladdening the bhikkhus with talk on the Dharma in the assembly hall? Who has been reciting the summary and exposition of one who has had an excellent night? It was the Venerable Ananda, Venerable Sir. Then the Blessed One asked the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, how were you instructing, urging, rousing, and gladdening the bhikkhus with talk on the Dharma and reciting the summary and exposition of one who has had an excellent night. I was doing so thus, Venerable Sir. Let not a person revive the past. Repeat the whole of the last sutta, 3-10, up to who has had a single excellent night. I was instructing, urging, rousing, and gladdening the bhikkhus with talk on the Dhamma thus, and reciting the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night thus. Good, good, Ananda. 
it is good that you were instructing, urging, rousing, and gladdening the bhikkhus with talk on the Dhamma thus, and reciting the summary and exposition of one who has had a single excellent night thus. 12-19. Let not a person revive the past. Repeat the whole of the last sutta. 3-10 up to who has had a single excellent night. This, that is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu. 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 It really is what one of the things you hear about Buddhism, I think, or mindfulness or spiritual practice, live in the now, trying to be present. It's something you hear people who practice mindfulness talking about a lot. It really is one of the key components. Definitely worth remarking on and uh, helpful because of how short it is. Uh, so it's not something long that you have to memorize. Worth memorizing this set of verses. I don't have to memorize the whole sutta, of course, but just the verse. If I can <clears throat> ask a question about the notion of self. Um, neurologists say that the notion of self is programmed into our brains. I mean, there's a specific part of the brain which is responsible for the sense of self. So my question would be, can we ever get rid of this notion if it's biologically programmed within us? Doesn't make any sense. The brain is not uh, mental, it's physical. So self can't be a part of it any more than color or sound. There's no, there's no self in, in, in matter, in the, the physical, in the brain. The brain is just flesh. But it's like some parts of the brains are responsible for smell or for touch. It's said that some parts of the brain are responsible for us perceiving a self. Well, what people say is not of any consequence. People say all sorts of things. So it is said, it is said, doesn't mean anything. You have to be more accurate than just making claims like this part of the brain is responsible. Even the word responsible is pretty vague and uh, and misleadingly vague because it's not, sorry, it's not just vague, it's misleading. Like it uh, implies more than is actually observed. You take the relation and then you apply extra meaning to it to say responsible. What does it mean to say that something is responsible? Yeah, so it is the cause of it. Maybe it's just is correlated. It? Maybe I miss. Well, there's there's a there's a causal relationship for sure. I mean, there's going to be uh, uh, conceptions of self arising from physical um, triggers. But that's all it is. It's just triggers and it depends on the mind. It's up to the mind as to whether it perceives it as self. And what, probably what they notice is that the such triggers don't occur for people with certain types of brain damage. Weird things happen to people with brain damage. But you, you can't say much about that because those people are not meditators. They weren't meditators before the brain damage. They aren't meditators after. So there's no meaningful comparison to be made just means the triggers don't arise. So there's an observation that the sense of self doesn't arise in the same way as it did before. But like a rock doesn't have a sense of self either. So the, um, well, I guess that's not a fair example, but the, uh, the brain allows for so many uh, ex types of experience and so with all of those, with some of those experiences, self arises, ideas of self arise. And the reason I bring up a rock is because the rock doesn't, doesn't have a sense of self, but it also doesn't have any experience. So 
Self just comes along with the experiences, some. But uh, this, the, the reason it comes along is not the brain. It's just uh, the brain is able to trigger the mind, the mind's delusion or the mind's wrong view or misperception. Dante, I think you said once that the brain is like a filter for the mind. So you could yeah, break you, the I mean, this is a... This is an idea, not a Buddhist idea, but a very old idea from observations that were not colored by this materialistic idea, of physicalist idea that the brain is the mind. And so they were honest and describing, trying to understand what was actually observed instead of trying to fit what's observed to your idea that there's only the physical and uh, William, I'm talking, I'm talking about William James, who was a very sort of powerful scientist, really, in the, I think, the early 20th century. William James was the one who said it's like a filter. And that was based on observations. You, there's no way you can uh, look at all of the crazy people out there and uh, objectively and say, yeah, this is all caused by something physical. The brain is creating these realities. It just didn't fit the case. And I had this preconception that if the sense of self is correlated with a part of the brain, then it has to be hard to overcome. But it seems I was wrong. No, nothing to do with the brain. I mean, what you'll see is the brain changes for people who have a strong sense of self, and there will be correlations certain parts of the brain. I mean, this is just a guess that there, that of course, um, your your thought process is going to be different when you have strong sense of self, and so that will affect the brain. But in the same way, there are certain types of, of again, physical triggers that are going to induce a stronger sense of self or a weaker sense of self, that sort of thing. It's just the, the brain, not exactly a filter, but a brain, the brain is a, more like a prison be quite oppressive and restrictive kind of like a filter i guess but also just restricting and even distorting sometimes but but also if the brain uh, have any physical density let's say like a weight seems to be solid for me like uh, the idea of not self is more clear when i think about the impermanence where everything is arising and ceasing, so then there is not any more a solidity. So right. the idea of no self- brain, brain is not real. It's not reality. It's a bad way of approaching anything uh, to talk about in terms of the brain, except um, anything except uh, worldly concerns. So if you want to, uh, if you want to cure brain cancer, you need to talk about the brain, and then it's imperative. But if you want to understand reality, it's a whole different way of looking at, at the world. Mm. Brain doesn't exist. Brain cancer doesn't exist. I mean, it's it's looking at it that from that perspective isn't going to get you anywhere in terms of letting go of the self, for example. It's, as you say, it's uh, it's not the brain is well. The brain is only ever experienced conceptually, and so anytime you perceive in terms of the brain you're already you've already lost contact with as the buddha says in the sutta present dhammas you're not seeing the present dhammas clearly you can't because what you're talking about is conceptual it's not those realities ante isn't also um, part of or a big problem of this whole um, concept of self on focusing too much on it because i found um, by the time i just didn't think about it too much. I, uh, I don't know. I didn't have a problem with that idea as much as I used to have. If I, when I, I, I don't know about Remus, but it sounds like you try a lot to not have this um, sense of self, even though you can't force it. <laughs> right, which is which is the quite exact opposite. Self has non-self has to do with not being able to control and just the perspective of, of not trying to control, trying to not try, trying to 
controlling yourself oh. from controlling or no what you're talking about is um, yeah controlling your controlling your belief in self or controlling your tendencies to perceive as self just strengthens the sense of self and there's a, a, a lot of it is to do with uh, the, the attachment to self because of how you want to be i want to be a person who is free from self or i want the benefits of being a person who is free from clinging to self so because you think it's me who is clinging and you feel ashamed or you feel bad or you crave that sense of self-worth that would come if you were a person who was free from wrong view or so on. There's this thing called the uh, Gana Sanya, which seeing things as it is lumps as a whole. As long as you don't view the world, you, you can't go past that, you won't be able to progress in uh, Vipassana. Um, just a little bit related to what Delaware was, I think, saying, I don't really know, but um, I, I too remember like when my teachers, my teachers or priests uh, started to talk about, let's say, the soul, um, I... I remember as a child that like I started to invent something that uh, like like how to relate to this like soul and just invent this self maybe and uh, is it is it possible that it's different this um, sense of self for ev ev anyone everyone or it's not even present maybe to people to children for example i don't think uh, i mean i remember like it, it was like just a thought process i wanted to invent something so i could understand what they are talking about well Wait. the idea of a soul is a pretty elaborate uh, it's just an elaborate concoction based on idea the idea of self uh, remember all we're talking about is that dhammas are not self the way we perceive experiences, the way we perceive realities, perceive them as them as not self, but the view of there being a soul is just an elaborate outcome of not seeing clearly. But anatta is just about the momentary clarity that does away with any kind of wrong perception or conceptual perception. Ante, am I understanding correctly that um, the soul refers to uh, Sakaya Diti and um, the, the, self is, the self is referring to the mana, like the self-conceit, when we say he hurt me or uh, it's so unfair and whatever, but... No, it's not like that. Conceit is conceit. Sakaya diti is sakaya diti. Well, you're on, you're kind of onto something. I mean, um, but the the reason why that thought arises is because like mana is just much more subtle, and also a little more uh, accurate, you know, more relation related to actual ultimate reality because mana is something that arises. But sakaya diti is is where is the coarse is more coarse and so it's what allows for the arising of concept like concepts of of a self the relationship between sakaya ditti and the view of self is is pretty on is on point but doesn't really have much to do with conceit i mean it, it does but doesn't mean that conceit is is the self it's just that because of perceptions of self uh, conceit still still persists. That makes sense. Sanya vipalyasa, right? But the sakaya diti is diti palasa. Yeah, yeah, basically. And jitta vipalasa also. It's just, uh, yeah, diti is just um, the more coarse or extreme form of 
I mean, it's the it's the problem that a sotapanna does away with. They can still perceive things as self, or have the recognition. Uh, sanya is a hard word, but it's something like between recognition and perception. Just how you see it. I mean, it's actually not that hard. It's just hard to find a good translation or a good definition. But the idea is pretty clear. You perceive things as as such and views are different because you believe views are next another step and they're the, they're what cause real problems as you you form a view about how you perceive if you perceive something as attractive that's that's sanya but when you say to yourself i like this there i mean it, the statement isn't but the, the statement usually usually shows that you are giving rise to the view of self like how we tell each other, I pref- I'm, I, I like this or I hate this or so on. We talk about our personality as though it were a thing. Is it like reaffirming things we already wrongly perceive? Yeah, it's reaffirming and we say reifying, like making them out to be something, something giving them meaning. Yeah, like reaffirming. But not quite just reaffirming. You make more. You make something extra. Yes, uh, yes, there is liking of this. But then you say, "I like this." It's not just in that one moment. You're, what you're saying is that I, I, I all this always exists in me, or this exists in myself. Is this liking this this quality of me to like things, to like this certain thing? I have this quality of liking. It's like karma, like, oh, I have bad karma or, or so on. Like, we're thinking that karma is a thing that you carry around. Also, the worst would be then when people say, I'm kind of, I'm a person like this, I'm kind of this person, sorry, uh, who usually doesn't do this or that and identify with um, just a kind of sort of people. If that's clear. Yeah, that would be more like upadana, atta upadana. That leads to a clinging. For example, sometimes I perceive a certain charm, complexity, and that's why it's hard to get rid of, to simplify my life or to get rid of a lot of harmful notions. I have a question relating to the text. I, I know that uh, when they mention the formula true man, but can you um, remind me what, um, for instance, in the ninth paragraph, who has regard for true man and his skills and discipline in their dharma? Uh yeah, not an, another uh problem, har, another hard translation like hard translate another problematic translation. I don't want to sound critical to Bhikkhu Bodhi. He's he's I mean, we're using his text for a reason. We appreciate them very much. But um yeah, a lot of the translations. I mean, translations hard, but Sapuri. Uh, I mean. A lot of these words could be much easily, much more simply translated without adding so much uh, meaning that isn't really there. Like true isn't, as I've said, as I've, I mentioned before, like it, it, it even adds the connotation of being a true man, like a masculine or like a real man. In English, we use the word, the phrase real man. We don't use it, but people use it to talk about someone who is not wimpy or not weak or not feminine or effeminate or that sort of thing you're not a real man unless you're masculine and tough and strong and so on um but yeah i don't i don't think you'd really get that from a buddhist text but true men is vague and hard to understand so the the prefix obviously is sa right it's a simple prefix means good the, the simplest way of translating sa is as good. 
just simple good a good person and the the reason i think he uses true is because he wants to say more than just good as well it's a bit weak to say you know, what does the buddha care about people just because they're they're good does what does that make someone worth listening to i mean actually it does because for someone to be truly good they have to be enlightened right but the the real point is that you only would call someone sapurisa if there were something sort of exceptional or special about them. Well, or not special, but something right about them. So sa also has the sense of right. There's a, a rightness about them. And so that's where he kind of says true, true men, but I don't know what a better translation or if there even is a better translation. I would probably translate, I've translated it before in my mind, but it's, it's good fellow, uh, like a good Samaritan kind of thing. But uh, the idea of a sapurisa is someone who is wise. That's really the best way to understand it. Someone who is spiritually advanced or uh, spiritually cultivated. But a good general understanding is just good. Someone who is good, who has goodness in them. It's kind of a colloquial phrase because obviously it's not it's not just uh, restricted to men. We're not talking obviously about the masculine gender, but uh, it's like how we use gentleman in English or good fellow or that sort of thing. So here it ref refers, it's, it's a way for the Buddha to refer to wisdom without talking about Buddhism. Like you wouldn't, he wouldn't say, here someone goes to someone from our religion or that sort of thing. It's just a general way of reminding of what's important. Why would you go to someone? Why do you go to the Buddha? Not because he's Buddhist. You go to the Buddha because he's a Sapurisa. And if anyone is worthy of the title of Sapurisa, it's the Buddha. Not because he's a true man or he's true in any sense, whatever the word true means. It's because he is uh, good. And by good, we really mean wise. Digital Valley Reader says also worthy, and you also mentioned the word wor worth and worthy. No, worthy is, I mean, it's not a literal translation. I don't think that's really the, the point about being worthy. There's other words that refer to one's worthiness. Worth listening to, but that's only implied. That's not what the word means. They're, they're worth listening to. But Sapurisa doesn't mean worth listening to. It means something that makes them worth listening to. Why should you listen to them? Because they are Sapurisa. That's why you should that's why they're worthy of listening to. You should listen to them. They're worthy of a lot of things. They're worthy of respect. They're worthy of support. They're worthy of veneration. All of that is they're worthy of all of that because they are Sapurisa. That's not what the word means. The word doesn't mean worthy. Like Buddha, Buddha doesn't mean worthy. Well, a Buddha is worthy of a lot of things. Yeah, Tingali Sitta just means Satpurisha, Satpurusa yeah, means uh, good person. We also have a uh, uh, Satbhave with, with good intention or sincere. Well, that's interesting. And I think we had this conversation before because Sat is from Satya, I think. Satya, isn't it? Uh, that's where he's we, have, we, have sat, we have a word called satya, so that is means true truth. So is that what they say satpurisa is? Satpurisa is uh, no. When you say satpurisa, it just means good person. So what is sat? Sat is a word? Uh, satya is a word. Satya means true. I know, but in this context, why, what is satpurisa? Satpurus. Satpurus. Satpurisa is always used for somebody who's good, like Bodhisattva or somebody who's teaching you the Dhamma or something. Sattaburut. In Thai, they say Sattaburut. I wonder what the Satta is. I think of oh, sincere. Someone is who is sincere. Right. Mm. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. Let's look it up. We think we've had this conversation before, but let's look it up in the commentary. The commentary will tell us. So maybe that's it. Maybe there is a Satcha involved. 
Oops. Where is that? It's also Satyakiriya. Uttama. It uses Uttama, which means highest. So a Satpurisa is the highest. It doesn't talk about truth. I mean, you don't, you can't get truth out of this, the prefix Sat. You just can't. Satpurisa Dhamma. Papa Purisa Nang. Oh, Asapurisa Dhamma. So the opposite of Satpurisa is Papa, evil person. Uh, yeah, Sat. I mean, it's a simple prefix. There's no need. You're not going to find a real explanation beyond that because it's such a simple word. I don't know how they get sat that. That's interesting. And if there's something I'm missing, because Bhikkhu Bodhi uses true, right? And such is truth. There must be something in that, but hard to see because it's a, such a simple word, sat plus purisa. What are you going to say? The and the commentaries seem to support that because we got papa purisa. So what's the opposite of sat purisa? Papa purisa, which means evil person or evil man. So sat purisa nang dhamma. Sapayasa sa dhamma. Buddha, Buddha dinang sapurisa nang yeah. There's no, there's no translation. There's no explanation beyond that. As such a simple word. Inasa sapurisa taro. Oh no. Kaliyana putta jana to pataya sabha so sapurisa nama. So even a putujana, a ordinary worldling, if they are kalyana, which means beautiful, meaning they keep the precepts, they're practicing meditation, they're following the Buddha's teaching, they aren't a sotapaniya. They are also called sapurisa. But kinasava, which is the uh, arahant, the one who has destroyed the, all the taints, is sapurisattaro, the highest of the... No, it's higher than a sapurisa, that's strange. Purisattaro. Better. Better than, yeah. What is the word? Sapurisattaro. Sapurisattaro. Is it a, uh, using sapurisa and uttara together? No, it's the, the suffix tara, which means more. So papatara means more evil. I see. So sapurisattaro means more good man, more of a good man. Then the Sangita Nikaya. And when I go to digital poly reader on the word sapurisanang from the text, it says that it's sant plus purisa. And when I go to sant, it, it says that uh, it's good and true. As the second, well, sant is uh, uh, yeah. So they do have sat. Yeah, that's where it is. Okay, so that's why the Thai gets sat satapuri sataburut. Uh, comes from sant. Sant would be peaceful. Weird. Yeah, they're taking it because this. There must be the Sanskrit word sat. There must be a Sanskrit word satapurisa. Sat Purusha, Purusha. Yeah, that's why, because, yeah, so it's not, it's not, I'm wrong. It's not simple Sat. It looks like that to me as a Pali scholar, but people who know Sanskrit would tell you that now it comes from Sanskrit Sat. Although I'm not entirely sure whether Sat just means Sat as well. Because in Pali, we don't have such a prefix Sat. So, but if I go for sand, it says a uh, PPR. I don't know what a uh, past uh, participle or present participle of ati uh, in the explanation. No, that's, yeah, that's sand, because santi is a, a verb form. Sand. Yeah. Santi. It's not sand, but santi. But uh, santi also means peace. Just a totally different word that happens to be spelled the same. So I think sant there is referring to peace. Uh, I may be wrong about that too. I found sound, sant. The first meaning is being or existing. The second meaning good, true. Oh yeah, santa means true, good. And santa means true. That doesn't seem right. No, I'm not where they're getting it from. For instance, is Santo. Someone told 
told me before about the difference before uh, about uh, rebirth and reincarnation, but uh, I I forgot. So can you please uh, can you please uh, explain it again? I mean, can you the difference between the, the these two words? Sorry, what two words? Uh, rebirth and reincarnation. Well, they're just words. They're just words. They have meaning for people who use them. They're not really accurate to describe. Neither one is really accurate to describe the truth. Do they have the same meaning? Or, I mean, well, that's the thing is we don't. We usually use rebirth, but it's not really a good word either. We probably shouldn't use either because they don't. Neither one accurately describes. I mean, it, so it's not really a question I can answer because we, they, they don't, they aren't the right word for Buddhist theory. Okay. If you want to understand, you can look up Buddhist uh, explanations on rebirth and we use the word, but you have to understand that it's probably not the best word. It doesn't really accurately describe what you're talking about. In, in Buddhism, how they, they, the words that they use about, you know, rebirth or reincarnation, is there well, words? They have a, they have a, a word for uh, relinking, which, which is probably why rebirth works, but it's, it's going too far because relinking is, just means linking back, linking again. I mean, rebirth, it's okay to use it. It's not like you're bad to use it. But this, just like with relinking, nothing is going back or coming back or something like that. Uh, Bhattisandhi could also mean linking specifically too, because bhatti can mean specifically. doesn't just mean back. So Bhattisandhi means specifying when the, when the chooses where it's going to go. So in Buddhism, it's just about birth and death. And they talk about it as a cycle. Okay. Uh, the cycle is just a um, colloquial way of describing it. Not really a cycle, it's a line. After death, there is birth. Rebirth, reincarnation, these are nothing to do with it. It's just death. And then after death, there's a new birth. But the thing that is born isn't the thing that died. That's that's really the crux of it. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Bante, I do have another question. Um, because also in paragraph 9, it, it says about uh, the danger in the present, I mean, is staying in the present uh, relating to clinging, but it says only about the idea of self. So it's clinging only related to the idea of self. No, if you're if you're in, and in, again, it's not invincible. It's not carried away. Invincible means not a good translation. When one is not carried away or caught up in. Sorry, best because it's a locative. So caught up in presently risen state. But yeah, it's enough to say self. The other thing, yeah, I mean, self is really the crux of it, but it's not only. He doesn't use the word only. If you're not caught up in it as self, you're also not caught up in it as permanent or satisfying. It means you see it clearly as uh, as arising and ceasing, as insubstantial. Three characteristics are are related. I mean, you can't see one and still misunderstand the.